welcome to To The Point. It's lovely to have your company again today. And as usual, as the format of To The Point is, we'd like to introduce to you irreducible complexity and to demonstrate that in God's creation, in science, in health, and in other aspects of our lives. And today, we're going to be talking about birds. Now, I don't know if any of you watched Alfred Hitchcock's um, film, The Birds, which was a horrible film, actually, with birds all fluttering everywhere. And it's quite not a very nice film, but, but birds are going to play quite a key role today. And uh, for those who like birds, some of you have got little birds' nests and birds' houses and things in your gardens. Um, you shall find this programme really, really interesting, won't they, Richard? Well, as I hope so, Laura. Love to be on with you again. And before I forget, Jeff Lister, thank you so much for writing to us. It's so lovely to hear from us virtually every week, and uh, we'd love to hear from more of you guys. But, uh, Jeff, thank you for <laughs> writing to us. It's such an encouragement. Thank you. Well, anybody else wants to write to us, it's info at revelationtv.com. So, uh, yes, we're talking about birds, and we're going to be talking about how, uh, how they fly and how they navigate, and they're both totally miraculous. The evolutionists say it all happened by chance. You watch these videos and make up your own mind. <laughs> <laughs> On that note of shout-outs, actually, Richard, I've got another shout-out, and it's to Morris and Linda Dyson. And they also sent, they sent me a letter. They don't do emails. So I got a handwritten letter from Morris and Linda Dyson. And just to say thank you so much, thank you for appreciating um, our programme, and God bless you. So, Richard, we're going to be reading, first of all, from Genesis. Genesis 1, 20 to 23, and it says, Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. <laughs> Shall we go to our fun facts? So we're going to watch one of Richard's fun facts on the hummingbird. <laughs> Hello, my name is Richard Kent. Uh, today I'd like to talk about something rather different, talk about hummingbirds, which I like to think of as God's tiny little miracles. Um, you'll be seeing a video now of uh, hummingbirds um, in, taken in slow motion. Now they're called hummingbirds because you can hear a hum as their little wings beat at 50 times a second. They make quite an audible hum. Now these little birds, they're about the size of your little finger, um, they are most attractive little things. They are quite unlike other birds. Uh, they can hover, they can go backwards, forwards, upwards, sideways, down. They can fly very fast, they can fly up to 60 miles an hour, um, but they can hover in one position um, because their wings move completely different to all other birds that we know about. Now, most birds, when they uh, beat their wings, there's an upstroke and a downstroke. Uh, the lift for all birds is provided in the downstroke, and in the upstroke, the feathers um, move apart so that the air can actually get through the feathers. Um, but but the, this is quite different from what happens in the case of a hummingbird. The hummingbird has very, very strong pectoral muscles on its chest wall, and the upstroke is just as powerful as its downstroke. Uh, the little wings move in a figure of eight movement, uh, a bit like rowing, if you like, so they can move backwards, forwards, upwards, sideways, and hover in midair, and they put their very long beaks uh, down very deep flowers so that they can sip uh, nectar, which is a sugary solution from the, from the flowers, they need to eat um, the whole body weight of nectar every single day because they have the highest metabolic rate of all known living organisms. 
uh, they have a fantastically high metabolic rate. Um, if you or I were, um, this is quite ridiculous, but if you or I were to eat as much as they eat, we would eat 1,350 hamburgers a day and not put on weight. They eat prodigious amounts of nectar. <laughs> now sometimes they come across uh, flowers where the nectar is too deep and they've got a, a tongue which, which is as long as their very long beaks uh, and will come out and suck the nectar out through special, long, uh, special little grooves in the tongue. The skeletons are extremely light, um, very, very light. Uh, they have a very, very low body mass index. And yet, although they are so tiny, uh, it's no problem at all for a, um, a hummingbird to fly 500 miles across the Gulf of Mexico using its extraordinary navigation equipment. Uh, they have uh, uh, hummingbirds, they navigate using obviously the sun. Uh, birds, the hummingbirds can, uh, can detect plain polarized light so they can see the sun even if it's cloudy. Uh, they have um, special um, iron oxide in their beaks and in their middle ears in the semicircular canals and also in the retina of their eyes. These are truly miraculous little birds. They are tiny and they are so extraordinary that the military have studied hummingbirds to see how they actually can fly so well. They're actually more like helicopters than planes. So these are truly little miracles and I, love, I know that the evolutionists like to think that these evolved but I defy any evolutionist to explain how uh, how a hummingbird could possibly evolve. It is so cleverly designed. Thanks for listening and God bless you. Welcome back to To The Point and thank you for joining us with Dr. Laura and Dr. Richard Kent. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard, we're not talking about human beings today, we're talking about birds. Yes. And we're focusing on birds because they are one of God's wonderful creations. And as you see, they were created in the fifth day of creation. Exactly, yes. So hummingbirds, fascinating. You were talking on the fun facts about the fact that they needed to uh, consume the body weight in calories per day. Yes. <laughs> and you made the analogy with the hamburgers. Um, how many of us would stay slim consuming that kind of uh, yes. amount of food, eh? Huge amount, a huge amount. Imagine whatever you weigh, you're eating your body weight in food every single day. And that's why they love sugar. They love nectar from flowers, but uh, for, unfortunately we don't have hummingbirds in UK very much, but uh, if you've ever been to Florida, they have lots and lots of hummingbirds there. And uh, lots of people actually put out little, little uh, cages full of sugar. And in fact, you saw them there. And the hummingbirds absolutely love the sugar. But one thing I, I forgot to tell you there in that little short video is that their temperature goes up and down. Now, you and I, we all have temperatures around about 98.4. Is that right, Laura? Um, 98.4 Fahrenheit, but uh, 38, 36 to 7 to 37.2 centigrade. Okay. So, yeah. You can, you can, tell, you can <laughs> tell that my dear friend Laura is a modern doctor. I'm a geriatric <laughs> doctor. I haven't done it for 20 years. It used to be in Fahrenheit, now it's in centigrade. But in the old fashioned stuff, which I'm used to, <laughs> and Laura isn't, uh, it used to be 98.4 on your thermometer. Anyway, our, our, our temperature is in a pretty narrow range. Um, and for example, in the old scale, not the modern scale, in the old scale, around about 98.4, if a child had a temperature over 100, you got quite worried about it. If a temperature went up to 104, you got very worried about it, uh, and you'd expect them to start fitting. Well, um, hummingbirds, uh, they have a temperature of 98.4 at some point <laughs> in the day, but their temp because their metabolic rate is so high, uh, th their metabolism is so fast and they're creating so much energy in the mitochondria of all their cells using all their oxygen and sugar which they mop up from, uh, fr 
uh, from the flowers and from the sugar that every, everybody puts out for them, that the temperature goes up to 105 Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in centigrade, Laura. Have you any idea? It's probably about 41, yes. something like that, 41, 42, but high, very high. I mean, a child will be in A&E by that stage. And I, I think I'm right in saying, remember I haven't done medicine for quite a long time now, but uh, at that temperature you'd be worrying about fitting. Oh, about, absolutely, they yeah. probably would be. That's they would be fitting, yeah. exactly, mm. yes. Well, uh, are the little hummingbirds, they're not fitting at all. They're quite happy about it. They, they suck up all the sugar, they metabolise all that sugar, a whole body weight every day. Uh, the temperature goes up to 105 Fahrenheit, um, and they don't worry about it no, uh, at all, but actually um, they can actually sleep while well, they're flying across uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which is 500 miles, and they just glide and sleep. But also they can sleep on hanging on branches or whatever. But when they sleep, they save energy by lowering their body temperature in Fahrenheit terms to below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's called a torpor. And actually, if you, if you find a sleeping hummingbird, Best not to touch them, but if you do, you find they're actually quite cold. They're not dead, they're just having a sleep and their metabolic rate goes right down. Um, as they like ha have a little hibernation every night. Most extraordinary, uh, most extraordinary metabolism. Um, now, coming to the irreducible complexity, they fly. Well, of course, we don't fly, but <laughs> these little birds, God created them to to fly. The first thing is they've got, they're tiny and they um, have very, very tiny little skeletons. Um, probably, um, the whole hummingbird weighs about the size of, of an empty matchbox. So you can get the, size, the feel of how, if, what, you can imagine an ordinary matchbox and no, no matches in it. Um, if you took just one match, that's how much the whole skeleton weighs. Just one match. But just think how cleverly God has designed the hummingbirds so that it can fly using these powerful pectoral muscles with all this amazing energy production in the mitochondria of the, of the uh, pectoral muscle to produce all this energy to fly 500 miles non-stop across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they are just extraordinary. Now, evolutionists say, oh, well, it, life evolved abiogenesis in a primordial slime, and that life evolved from non-living matter like rocks and, and goodness knows what. I'm not going to go there because it's all garbage. <laughs> um, no, on day five, God said, well, we're going to have fish, which uh, is another miracle, by the way, because they've got swim bladders. And we're going to be talking about that another, on another occasion, got how fish swim with using their swim bladders <laughs> but birds fly because they're very very light uh, uh, doctor doc, dr lord's very clever doctor and she's uh, up to date unlike me and she talks about body mass index and a normal correct me if i'm wrong but a more normal body mass index for humans is between 20 and 25 right that's absolutely right, right. for little hummingbirds it's five wow. <laughs> they are tiny they are just tiny. I mean, if a human had a body mass index of five, they, uh, they would be dead. But they're not dead at all. They're very, very happy little birds flying away at 60 miles an hour, temperature going up and down all over the place. They're not fitting. They're, they're sucking this nectar out. Um, they've got their little tongues coiled around inside their skull. They're sucking away in that nectar. Um, and uh, they're so attractive, actually. Um, and they can fly upside down, they can fly straight, they can fly upside down, they can hover, they go backwards, forwards, sideways, other way. When they, when they come to, they can bank like this. Now actually banking, when you've only got two wings, is actually very complicated. Banking, you think about it. God designed hummingbirds. God designed hummingbirds. They did not evolve. How do you evolve if you're a, a mouse and say, I want to fly, I'll grow some wings. Here we go. Bigger, bigger. Problem is, a mouse weighs too much. You'd have to have wings the size of my hand for a mouse to fly. Ah, uh, no, God designed. God designed hummingbirds. In fact, God designed all birds. In fact, feathers are fantastic. I'm going to do a whole program about feathers. Because, uh, hey, the feathers are fantastic. Because when, when they're beating down like that, they c collect all the air. And when they come up, the, the feathers come apart. So the air falls through, the, goes passes through the, the little barbules of the feathers. And the feathers are just 
Miraculous. Absolutely, totally miraculous. We can't design a, a, um, any sort of aeroplane that flies using feathers. We just can't do it. We haven't got the technology. Only one person can do that. Only one person got technology of that. His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ. What do you think, Laura? I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Jesus Christ, our creator, but also the creator of the birds and the bees and the fish and the flowers and everything wonderful. So we are so excited that uh, I hope, and I hope you're excited too about this amazing. You sound, you sound like you should be an ornithologist, really, shouldn't you? <laughs> Bird watching. <laughs> I mean, it's such a fascinating subject, isn't yes. it, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, should we move on? Because we've got another sort of fun fact. Yeah. This has more to do with birds. The whole programme is about birds today. So we're going to go on to the next uh, section, birds. Is that OK? Yes. And that starts with the scripture, and it's from Colossians 1, verses 15 to 16. And here goes. It says, In He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, there in heaven, and there on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And that kind of emphasizes the point that God, he is the creator. He's a creator, isn't he? Mm. Jesus Christ created all things. By him, all things were made. The birds that fly, the fish that swim. Yeah. That sounds like a very interesting song, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, <actually>. Sash Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We're going to go on to our next fun fact, and this is about how birds navigate. Hello, my name is Richard Kent. Uh, today I'd like to talk about how birds navigate. It's actually a complete mystery how birds navigate, and we still don't really know, but it is truly remarkable. One of the most famous birds that, uh, is the sooty shearwater which uh, navigates um, twice a year uh, from um, New Zealand uh, across the whole of the Pacific, uh, 20,000 miles at 300 miles a day, to um, California and Alaska and Japan. And then, uh, six months later, comes back again another 20,000 miles, another 300 miles a day, and navigates right back to the original nest. They have their original nest in the two different countries, whichever country they're going to. Now the question is, how do they do it? It's something absolutely extraordinary. Now all birds um, use the sun. Uh, birds can, are constantly aware of the position of the sun and it doesn't matter whether it's cloudy or not because birds see plain polarised light which of course comes through the sun. So actually not just birds but insects and virtually anything, anything that flies is very aware of the position of the sun. Secondly, obviously birds will use their eyes to get visual clues of landscapes and horizons and that sort of thing. But that wouldn't get you from New Zealand to um, uh, Canada or, uh, or um, Japan or um, California or Alaska, or anywhere like that. No, they have to have something much, much more profound than that. And what, they, what it is believed is that um, these amazing sooty shearwaters and also other birds that also uh, navigate as well, that's all birds virtually, um, they actually use uh, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. And that is truly amazing. They are actually sensitive to the magnetic field of the Earth. Now, you and I are not sensitive or even aware of the magnetic field of the Earth, but migrating birds are very aware of the magnetic field of the Earth. And they actually have um, um, iron oxide in their beaks and also in the semicircular canals in their ears and they also have um, cells in the back of their retinas, which are also electronic, they're also aware of changes in magnetic fields. And these uh, three uh, sources of magnetic, um, uh, magnetic awareness from the beaks and the semicircular canals and the ears, and also the, um, from the cells in the retina of the eyes, uh, is fed to the brain, 
which then has a seriously complex task to do, because the brain then computes the position of the sun, which is moving all the time, the position of the clouds, the position of the land below, the change in the wind, because remember, wind changes all the time, so they have to keep, just like an aeroplane, they have to keep adjusting their flight according to how much wind is going across their, um, if they're flying from north to south and there's a west-east uh, wind, then they'll have to adjust their flight uh, to fly, to veer more to the west than to the east in order to stay on target, as it were, and keep on the right navigation field. But the thing is, their navigation isn't just a little bit right, it's 100% right. They know exactly where to go. Uh, after 20,000 miles, travelling 300 miles a day, these little birds, and they're tiny, know exactly where to go and land in the same nest year after year after year. Now, if that isn't an example of God's design built into tiny little birds, I don't know what is. That couldn't possibly evolve. How could you evolve a navigation system that involves a magnetic field? Um, imagine you're a bird sitting somewhere down in New Zealand and say, well, I'd like to fly to somewhere up north, let's have a go. Sorry, that's not going to work, you're going to drown on the way. No, this is an example of God's amazing intelligent design. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Welcome back to To The Point and another very interesting, very engaging uh, fun fact by Richard. Thank you, Richard, for that yeah. on how birds travel. And as you said, you know, we don't stand a chance of getting very far <laughs> with the way God has designed this if we were going to go from um, here to Israel or wherever. <laughs> yes, but the birds do. Don't they? They certainly do. And then you were talking about iron oxide and how po poisonous actually iron is, excessive iron yes, is to us. Absolutely. In certain medical conditions, they actually have to have iron drained uh, from them because of uh, there's yeah. too much iron, iron overload. And yet these use the same thing to, to navigate. Talk, talk a little bit more about that. Um, well, yes, I mean, well, let's just talk about the navigation. Okay. Um, we'll bring in the iron oxide. Okay. Um, air traffic controllers, uh, all over the world, we have lots of them in UK, are, are very, very highly paid because actually what they do is actually very complex because, um, and actually what the pilots, uh, the pilots don't personally do it these days, the computers do it, but the computers uh, in the aeroplanes, they do what's called vectoring. You probably know, well, perhaps you, don't, you might not be aware, but if you go a long distance, like I regularly fly to Australia to see my daughter, one way it takes 19 hours, coming back it takes 21 hours, and it's all to do with the wind. One way the wind helps you, another way the wind is going the wrong direction, if you see what I mean. Um, but that's just one factor. There are a lot of other factors, the humidity, the air pressure, um, all sorts of factors change the vectoring. So that, for example, if you're flying in a plane or if you're a bird and you want to go from uh, New Zealand to uh, Alaska, uh, which is a very long way, <laughs> you've got to do a lot of vectoring because the horizon keeps changing and they, they do it using the magnetic fields of the Earth. The Earth has magnetic fields and by the way the magnetic field is changing because the magnetic North Pole is changing and we maybe need, should do a programme about that too. That is a very, very interesting subject. The magnetic North Pole is changing and a lot of the uh, GPS systems are not working properly because of the change of the magnetic North Pole. However, that wouldn't affect the birds because God has, pl uh, God has built into the uh, birds um, the ability to detect, detect changes in the magnetic fields, uh, changes in the horizon, the, uh, the, ch the, the sun of course is moving across the horizon and they vector that as well because they use the position of the sun for, for navigation. Um, but coming back to the magnetic fields, they, they need a little tiny magnet. So they've got them in their eyes, their ears and their beaks and they're made of iron, and of course iron is toxic, 
uh, 100 years ago in Victorian times, people died all the time of iron toxicity. But God has overcome that. Are these miraculous, these birds? I think they're totally miraculous. Totally miraculous. What do you think, Lord? I agree with you. I agree <laughs> with you. I love certain birds, I have to say. You know, I have questioned God making the wood pigeon, though. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, when I have, you know, you've got trees outside the, the, the window, the bedroom, and these wooden wood pigeons, whatever they're <laughs> called, start to make that their rhythmical alto sound. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been, what we've been talking about, we've been watching um, Fun Facts and Birds today. We've enjoyed, I, I, I certainly enjoyed, and I hope you have too, Richard's explanation of how the hummingbird works and how birds navigate all pointing to the fact that God created them. We've shown you from scriptures as well, both from Genesis and Colossians, that these were designed by God. We've been fearfully and wonderfully made and designed by him. So if you want to interact with us, then don't forget to do so on uh, emailing us on info at revelationtv.com and certainly go onto the Revelation TV website. We've also got a YouTube channel as well uh, and we'd love to hear feedback from you. Keep writing those letters and keep encouraging us and we'll keep doing the programmes and to the point. So Richard, thank you. Any last minute, um, anything else you want to say before we, we close? We haven't got very long. Uh, just if anything, if anything you'd like us to cover in, from, uh, in these programs, just write to infrevelationtv.com and say, please cover this. Good. Well, <laughs> certainly, you heard it from Richard and you're hearing it from me. Thank you for watching. Love to see you again. Stay tuned and keep watching Revelation TV. God bless.